get to cross a range of hills. Not sure which ones these are. Airbase Parkway, which also has, the exit has another name like Waterford or Waterton or something like that road, but Airbase Parkway is the one to be on. And then you have to go a few miles on it before getting to the actual entrance to the base. straight ahead there. I can see aircraft and hangars and such. appears to be the main gate up here. entrance to the Travis Air Force Base Aviation Museum, formerly known as the Jimmy Doolittle Aviation Museum or something like that, formerly known as about two or three other names, but the current name is Travis Air Force Base Aviation Museum. You can hear the sounds of jets because the runway and the apron are just right about there. They uh, come and get you at the uh, Travis Air Force Base Visitor Center with their uh, shuttle vehicle. There's a KC-10. So we have some cockpit trainers in the back room here. 
What do we have here? Looks like an engine from a Titan II, probably. Well, it's from the Titan IV, okay. So, yeah. A double nozzle, single engine. And here we have a, a T37 cockpit trainer. And there is an Apollo miniature mock-up kind of arrangement. And a Gemini type capsule miniature. And a sort of a rough mock-up of a Mercury capsule. A T28 cockpit trainer. And an F100 cockpit trainer, complete with all the connectors and relays and things to go to the training console. Travis Fire Department fire engine. And this is the so-called engine room. This is supposed to be a, um, like a diagnostic or training model for a thrust reverser of a C5 engine. No doubt the old kind. has its own hydraulic pump and reservoir, center console with just the bare minimum things to operate, and then the uh, hydraulics for thrust reverser actuation. And over here we have a TF-39 engine, the original kind from the C5. They don't look quite that big when they're hanging from the airplane, do they? General Electric TF-39 turbofan. And this is a Pratt & Whitney TF-30, a low bypass turbofan engine, originally designed for the F-6D Missileer aircraft. Some variation on this power the F-111 and the F-14 Tomcat. This is a Soviet jet engine, 
as used on the MiG-19 and the Yak-25. And a Pratt & Whitney J60 or JT-12. This kind was used on aircraft such as the T-38 Sabre Liner, the Sikorsky S-69 or XH-59, the C-140 Jetstar, the T-2B Buckeye, and others. This is a Liberty 12 from the early 1900s. Propeller off of a B-29. A uh, Wright R3350 duplex cyclone piston engine. A B25 propeller. And this is a Pratt & Whitney R4360 Major Wasp, or is it the Wasp Major? This powered uh, aircraft such as the Boeing C-97 Stratofreighter, the Douglas C-124 Globemaster II, the Boeing B-50 Superfortress, the Convair B-36 Peacemaker, the Northrop B-35 Flying Wing. The Corn Cob. The Wright R1820 Cyclone, which uh, powered things like the DC-1, the DC-2, early versions of the DC-3, some of the DC-5s, the Boeing B-17, the Douglas SBD Dauntless dive bombers, and uh, some helicopters and so on. So not a very deep engine. Just the one row. And this is a Wright R2600 twin cyclone, which uh, powered things such as the Douglas A20 Havoc, the North American B25 Mitchell, as used by the uh, first bombing raid on Tokyo. I think there may have been some other kinds of engines they could use. The Grumman TBF Adventure, the Curtis SB2C Helldiver, and the PBM Mariner Flying Boat. This is a Pratt and Whitney J57 jet engine. Powered the North American F100 Super Sabre, um, the F102 Delta Dart, Chance Fought F8U1. Uh, the U-2 Reconnaissance Aircraft, the Republic F-105, Thunder Chief, Prototype, and Northrop's Snark Intercontinental Guided Missile. The Pratt & Whitney T-34 Turbo Wasp. The uh, first use of this engine was on the Boeing YC-97J Stratofreighter, which uh, later got uh, was used as the Aerospace Line Super Guppy. Then it was also used as the on the Douglas C-133 Cargo Master. The General Electric Allison J33, which was used on things like the T33, the P80, the XF92, the A2 Savage, the F94, and a couple of cruise missiles. Over here we have a Lycoming 
G5480, B186, or is it B1, B6? Supercharged, six cylinder, 340 horsepower, used on things like the Beechcraft L238, L23D, or is it the L23B? I can't read their uh, typography here. The Beechcraft D50F, and other things. This is a Pratt & Whitney R2800, cutaway thereof, used on the Douglas A26, Martin B26, Curtis C46, Fairchild C123, Convair C131, and Republic P47. So it's just basically the double wasp engine, but in cutaway. This is a Wright R3350 cutaway. Uh, again, this type was used on the B29, the B19, the B32, the C119, the C121, and the DC7. These are some carburetors and other cutaways. And this guy here is, uh, looks like one of the early cruise missile types. Complete with the uh, pylon to which it would normally be attached for launching. And um, apparently this is a sort of a cutaway showing some of the uh, electronic equipment that was used in it. Uh, guidance computer and conversion and control unit, guidance system power supply, stable platform amplifier assembly, um, ammonia tank for cooling, a heat exchanger. Yeah, this is the uh, Hound Dog. It shows a couple of them underneath a uh, B-52. This is a General Electric J31 turbojet. This kind was used on things like the P-59 Era Comet, the P-59 Era Comet, well, that's the same airplane. The Westinghouse J34, used on things like the F-7U Cutlass, the experimental XF uh, 85 Goblin, the F6U Pirate, the XF90, the X3 Stiletto, and the F3D Sky Knight. And then the last engine in here is the General Electric J47 turbojet, used on things like the B47, the B36 for the, um, for the jets that were on it, the F-86 Sabre, the B-45 Tornado, the XF-87 Blackhawk. Okay, over here we have a Vietnam era AT-17. That's the tip of a vertical stabilizer from a B-17. Uh, which crashed while on weather patrol off the coast of Oregon. It had lost its way and crashed into the mountainous or the mountains of southern Oregon in October 1942. The tip of the stabilizer was found in 1953 by a troop of Boy Scouts while on a hiking outing. So the red area shows the part that's 
right here. And then coming around the AT-17, there's miscellaneous things like a Norden bomb site, an automatic computing gun site from a B-17, various aviation equipment from a B-17. This looks like it's a radio transmitter. Yes, it's a, a BC-375E radio transmitter by General Electric. And this is a polar converter to convert computed vertical and horizontal rectangular components of distance from the aircraft position to the aim point or destination point, converting that into polar coordinates for use in the solution of the navigation and bombing problems. And over here, we have um, one of the fat boy, or fat man rather, fat man um, bombs. This is the type of nuclear weapon which was detonated over Nagasaki, Japan on August 9th, 1945, which was the second and last time a nuclear weapon was used in warfare. This is a real casing, but there's nothing inside of it. But it's not a mock-up, it's the real thing minus the explosive part. And there's a lot of other small things, aircraft models, tons of stuff you could spend a lot of time on here. Here's a Link Trainer. with the student and the instructor. A uh, small printing press and the typesetting desk. Popcorn machine. Military looking uh, passenger seats. A uh, cockpit section from a Waco or Waco CG-15 combat glider. Very Spartan. Different types of uniforms used at Travis, Travis Air Force Base. A display on the WASPs. A display on the China Burma India or CBI. A nice ALCO for the Tuskegee Airmen. And this is the Comran. Bay Air Base <laughs> mock-up thereof for Operation Homecoming. It's a Cessna O2 with a Gatling gun. Forward air control from the Vietnam War. Again, lots of cutouts for improving observation capabilities. A re rear equipment area plus the pilots.
display of various Air Force uniforms. This should be an L5 here, a Stinson L5 Sentinel from the uh, World War II era. And then there's a, a Piper L4 Grasshopper here as well. Lots of nice displays if you have the time to look at them. There's a nice scale model of a KC-10 refueling a C-141. This is the front desk. This is a BT-13. In other words, the Volte BT-13 Valiant. And this is a PT-19, Fairchild PT-19 Cornell. And a very nice display on the aerial refueling. including the business end of a uh, Boeing air refueling boom. Doesn't say what this is from, which particular airplane. Nice picture of a C-131. Pictures of a B-36. <laughs> I like that. So now we're in the air park outside the museum, and the first airplane we encounter is a C-47. Oh, let's take a moment here. There's a KC-10 sitting down there in the distance. You can see the uh, third engine up on the tail. Anyway, so we have a C-47 here. Okie dokie. The Douglas C-47 Skytrain. Now they've got this area roped off so you can't... Well, maybe you can. Yeah, it looks like we can. Good. They have uh, an AT-11 here. The uh, museum is housed in the old commissary building of Travis Air Force Base, which was vacated and they've been using it as the museum since then. 
they keep wanting to relocate but there's always some issue with preventing them from doing that so uh, again a beach or Beechcraft AT11 can cans Kazanis K A S A N S I don't know if that's a misspelling or if I'm remembering incorrectly. And uh, here's a C-131. This is a Convair aircraft, a C-131D Samaritan. And um, way back there, we've got a U-3A blue canoe. Here we have a Convair F-102 Delta Dagger. And there's a F-101 here. Made by McDonald, called the Voodoo. It's an, actually an F-101B. And then we have an F-86 back here. North American F-86L Sabre. And then I think this is an F-84. Republic F-84F Thunderstreak. Way over there is a C-141, but I don't think it's actually considered to be part of the museum. Another KC-10 taking off. time I was here I counted about 20 KC-10 takeoffs and not a single C-5, although a lot of C-5s operate out of Travis Air Force Base. So coming up here about where the white truck is, that should be an F-100, unless I'm getting squirrely here. We'll verify that when we get to the sign. Yeah, North American F-100 Super Sabre. And right next to it is a T-33. Made by Lockheed, known as the Shooting Star. So once again, we're back to the C-47, and we get into the larger part of the air park now. We're greeted right off the bat with a C-124. Uh, I believe that's a Globemaster II. I always knew it as old shaky. 
I didn't have much respect for these when I was a kid and they had them at Scott Air Force Base. But um, they were being flown by the reserves at that point. <clears throat> but in later years I came to appreciate it a lot more. Yeah, it just says Globemaster here, but I thought that this was the Globemaster 2. Anyway, Douglas. The wings and engines and such are supposed to be related to um, one of their other aircraft, like a, the fuselage being outsized, but a lot of other parts in commonality. Really, uh, <clears throat> after you get just a few feet behind the actual engine, which of course is just out to about here, that's the actual engine, then there's pumps and oil tanks and stuff here. Probably why there's oil leaking from there. And then you've got a firewall, and then this whole section of the nacelle is uh, for storage of the landing gear and for the landing gear mechanism and after that it the nacelle sort of fades back into the wing there's some of the flaps mechanism Yeah, I like these guys. They don't restrict your access. You can come up to them and look closer if you want. So you've got um, retractor uh, mechanisms here. Very simple mechanism compared to today's airplanes. There's uh, your steering mechanism. And basically just a big empty hole. Next we have a C-45 basically another version of the beach or the twin beach civilian aircraft I've always liked this airplane it's the kind of thing where I thought if I ever wanted to fly and I had enough money for a twin engine this is probably the kind I would like to fly so it's the beach C-45H Expediter I do have a video on this airplane not this exact one, but one like it, operated by the Commemorative Air Force, where I had a chance to fly on it in the cockpit uh, out of Janesville, Wisconsin, a number of years back. And over here we have an AT-26, the Douglas a A-26K Invader. World War II aircraft. Something's making a lot of noise over there. Every time I come here, I wish I could see the flight line a little better. I think it would be pretty cool due to the types of aircraft they operate here. This guy here is an 
SA-16. I believe that's made by Grumman. Amphibious aircraft. Yep, the Grumman SA-16 Albatross. So this guy could land in the water or pull out its landing gear and roll up on runways from the water or beach itself or take off from hard runways. Pretty simple landing gear. I always thought this was kind of cool that the whole landing gear is supported from the wing right in the engine nacelle area. And then it has a break in the middle, which gets pulled in by this hydraulic uh, ram or piston. And that breaks it in the middle, and then that swings up into the uh, junction of the, the wing and the fuselage, right into the fairing there. And then this part of the landing gear goes down here. And then, of course, the wheel gets tucked into that space, and then the stabilizing mechanism gets tucked into this space. <laughs> it all fits in there quite nicely. But it's not waterproof, so if you're if you're operating the thing out of the water, this area gets wet all the time. I'm not sure what that did for maintenance. And a C-119 Fairchild. Uh, if you've seen my recent video on the Castle Air Museum. I was commenting at some length about how much I love this aircraft and wish that I had a chance to serve on it. This one is in a lot better cosmetic condition than the one at Castle, but it hasn't been here nearly so long, I think. It's had a more recent paint job. The flying box car. And then back here we have a C-56. Made by Lockheed. It's the Lodestar. 17 passenger civilian airliner is what it's based on. This was delivered to the U.S or the United States Army Air Corps in June 1941, was fitted out for executive transport duties. Her first assignment was to Bowling Field, Washington, D.C. It served with the military until 1945. Perfectly good airplane, just not a well-loved one. We're back to the C-119 again. Had those high booms so the tail's completely out of the way, but a big authoritative tail for a serious airplane. And then you had the clamshell doors, which also had side doors on the clamshell. So you could open up whichever one's made sense. If you're just bringing in personnel or smaller cargo or if you really have to open it up and put down a ramp. And once again we can look at the landing gear. Once again it folds up into the nacelle, in this case mostly below the wing. Very solid uh, stabilized landing gear intended for operations out of rough fields. Very strong. And of course, that's the kind of duty this airplane would have had.
one of my favorites and one of the very few places you can see a C-133. This here is the last C-133 to ever fly. It was one of a few that were owned by the only civilian operator of C-133s which had them on a limited use arrangement where they could only use them for certain types of thing. Uh, the US government still had some regulations regarding their use for other things. The airplane was not considered all that safe, but it was a stopgap between uh, other airplanes and uh, replaced by the C-5. Until the C-5 became operational, the C-133 was the biggest U.S. Air Force cargo lifter and it has turboprop engines so very powerful but there were design issues the square bladed propellers uh, at, the, at the RPMs these things operated flung just punishing shock waves against the side of the fuselage and caused a lot of fatigue issues uh, as I was saying this one was operating in Canada or Alaska rather Alaska for a lot of years hauling equipment for the pipelines and so on I'm not sure what all and then finally it was flown down here and landed right at Travis Air Force, Travis Air Force Base during an air show and uh, that was the last time a C-133 flew there are videos of this airplane flying and landing on that flight that you can see on YouTube there's quite a nice video documentary of the whole flight, although sometimes people break it up and just show part of it. And um, then there's at least one video of it landing uh, from people on the ground, and another video of it landing here taken from the cockpit, so a pretty well documented flight. Since I was here last, they repainted it. It looks like they need to do something with the gust locks on the on the elevator. Looks like they're kind of coming undid. And the rudder is off of it at this time. Looks like it's laying down there on the ground. I'm not sure if this thing, it kind of looks like it suffered some damage, doesn't it? It looks like the elevator came crunching down and dinged into the metal there. Not sure how that happened. But they do have its large and somewhat damaged looking rudder. Yeah, look at that. Something folded up where it shouldn't ought or have. It obviously moved more than it should have and hit the stops and tore up some sheet metal. Something big operating back there. You just can't see it for these buildings. You can see they put some uh, kind of jury-rigged framework up there to protect it. And then um, this should be, this is I think the newest addition, and it should be a C-140. to use some roundup on this uh, apron here. And 
then of course we have a B-52 over here, looking very nice. Tail end of a B-29. Like a lot of air museums, they don't have enough room and they have to jam a lot of airplanes into a, a fairly small space, making it hard to get far enough away from them to see the whole thing, at least with a camera. So this is a B-52D Stratofortress, made by Boeing. forward landing gear area and remember that the uh, B-52 landing gear fold up rather uniquely. They twist and shift and everything in order to get them up into this fairly small uh, landing gear area in a, what's really a fairly narrow fuselage. So one of these folds up, well it's clearly this one, this guy here folds up and into this space occupying a good part of it it kind of goes in at an angle and then um, a uh, mirror image cutout is back here where this guy similarly folds up into this space and there's a big heavy frame member there, you can see it in green, that carries a lot of the uh, load from the landing gear to the structure of the aircraft. So the landing gear doors are kind of asymmetrical. And then the landing gear towards the rear is exactly the same. Yeah, you can see a few KC-10s. There's one there. And then there's a couple of more. You can see the tails there, but everything else, everything is raised up or there's a building in the way. Not a great place to look at airplanes flying. And this is a C-123. Another Fairchild cargo plane. This has a lot of commonality in its philosophy with the C-119 that I like, but this guy always strikes me as being a little less interesting, which is just my impression of it, not necessarily historical fact. And I probably wouldn't have minded serving on one of these, but I think I would have preferred the 119. But the kinds of missions they got, this still got a lot of the same kind of mission. So over here, we have a uh, a C-7, should be a de Havilland Caribou. signage out for this one, but I'm sure that's what it is. And 
And then we have a C118 here. There's a fly that's shown particular fondness for my hand. Wants to land on it and bite me. Again, a relatively simple landing gear on this puppy. Goes right up into the nose, folds forward, and the only thing that's left is just a little room up there for the radome. Aluminum then fiberglass, I think. So the uh, C-118 is a Douglas DC-6, I think, uh, military version, and it's called the Liftmaster. It's an improved version of the C-54, originally designed as the DC-6 airliner, yep. Uses the same wing as the C-54, the C-118 fuselage was lengthened and the aircraft was re-engined with more powerful 2,500 horsepower Pratt & Whitney R2800s. The uh, 19th production DC-6 was designated as a VC-118 and modified to replace the aging C-54 Sacred Cow presidential aircraft. It differs from the standard DC-6 configuration in that the aft fuselage was converted into a stateroom. The VC-118 was nicknamed Independence after President's Tru President Truman's hometown in Missouri, but that's not this aircraft, but it's the same basic type. So the uh, remaining airplane we haven't looked at yet here is the B-29. Oh yeah, I was going to stick my head into the landing gear here before we go over there. So once again, the B-29. Marked as Miss America 62, but it's like Miss, like you're missing America, I think. Um, so, this aircraft, like I think most of the aircraft here are technically on loan from the United States Air Force Museum at Wright-Patterson Pat, Wright Air Force Base in Ohio. As huge as that museum is, they technically own a whole lot more airplanes which are scattered around in various museums, some of them quite large. Uh, and they could at any time recall them, send them to another museum or whatever. But it's a good scheme. I think it allows the Air Force Museum to have a lot of planes saved in one way or another and uh, still get them displayed in more places so people can see them without having to travel just to Wright-Patterson to see them. Plus, of course, to keep them under roof there would be hugely impractical and expensive. I do have a video 
of me flying in the cockpit of the commemorative Air Force B-29 Fifi. If you ever wondered what it looks like to be up in the nose of this thing while it's flying, you could seek out that video. So it's taken me just about two hours to just casually walk around this museum inside and out without really stopping and studying anything. So you viewers, if you happen to come here, you should leave at least a couple hours plus the time for the protocol at the front gate if you want to have a chance to see everything.